Our guest today, joining us originally from California, played his collegiate baseball at Cal State Fullerton, won a national championship in 1995, got drafted in 95, went back trying to repeat. Unfortunately, they didn't, but got drafted again in 1996 by the Kansas City Royals, Jeremy Giambi. Jeremy, thanks for joining us today. No, appreciate you guys having me. Uh, excited to be here with you guys and talk a little bit about baseball, talk a little bit about myself, um, how I've transitioned from a career and now what I'm doing in baseball. Um, at this time, I'm doing some personal hitting lessons. I work with teams, um, kind of tried to get involved in, you know, the future of our sport and hopefully give back a little and some knowledge. Some of the stuff I learned growing up, some of the stuff I learned later in life, and trying to put it all together and trying to give these kids, you know, and, and older kids, adults, whatever, young men, you know, the ability to um, use that knowledge to the best of their ability. No. Right. We couldn't yeah. agree more, man. I think it's awesome when you're, when you're a player and, you know, your, your career comes to an end, whichever way it does, and then you, you stay involved with the game and you try and share your knowledge or, or spread it one way or another. That's, that's kind of what we're trying to do. Mick's, you know, Mick never made it to the big leagues, but he was a minor league guy and, and is still trying to stay within the game, and that's exactly what he's doing. So yeah. we're in the same boat. No doubt. And I was able to uh, sit in and uh, – watch one of Jeremy's uh, Zoom call hitting sessions that he was holding, and it's awesome. It's not every day you get to hear big leaguer kind of speak about hitting, and it's a, someone that your resume speaks for itself. For those who don't know, Jeremy played, was drafted by the Royals, played with the Athletics, the Phillies, the Red Sox, has been all throughout baseball, and it's, it's an awesome opportunity that you're staying within the game and trying to help the youth learn and grow and put themselves in the best position to pursue this game as long as they can. Yeah, no, exactly. I think I think when I was away from the game for a while, I kind of missed it, you know, kind of just being around it, kind of missed talking it. You know, I've, I've kind of, uh, you know, felt that, you know, energy, you know, and, you know, gaining great relationships back in all this. So it's been kind of fun and it's it's a new journey in my life. For sure. Definitely. I think it's a great journey, man. I think you're already doing awesome and and people are are blessed to have you uh explain baseball to them one way or another no doubt i i got a question for you about the uh just the money ball era so as as you were kind of a part of that a big part of that i wanted to get your thoughts on like was it something that guys had question marks about when the athletics kind of had this new approach to the way they played the way they signed guys the way they started guys or, or or just managed the game a little bit differently when that was going on what was uh basically like the dugout talk about all that you know I, I think at the time everybody kind of bought into it you know and I think as it became yeah. to have more success obviously everybody jumps on board you from from a statistical standpoint it makes sense right but on that right. point, you have to have guys that are doing the stuff that you want them to do, whether it's taking pitches, doing these different things as to not stealing, not bunning, not giving away outs. You know, it, it has to be a, a, a group effort as to the lineup, as, as to these different things to make it work. And, of right. course, we, we had some – we had a great core of guys – that complemented that and and Billy added the pieces and you know it it worked and it made us su successful yeah absolutely no and that's what um like that time wasn't it there was a good stretch you, you were running as the leadoff guy correct leadoff hitter yeah not your prototypical leadoff guy but you know, in baseball and where we were and possibly where it's going is, you know, it's about putting on guys on base. I know if you guys see now, a lot of big hitters are moving to the two hole. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you saw that. Obviously, yeah. there's statistics behind it and theories, more bats, um, getting, get, getting those guys up to the plate one more time or two more times, you know, over yeah. a season. It, it, it's, 
it's more the numbers of over a season, how it benefits you. You know, I don't think it's one particular game or, or, or extra at bat in a game. Yes, those are important, but it's also the importance over a season. Um, you know, I kind of, I kind of relate it to this whole statistical outlook is they're looking at it like a casino. The house is going to win eventually if the numbers do That's what exactly they're right. to do. Yeah, no, that yeah makes-, makes total sense. I mean, the, the two-hole idea, what happened here in Pittsburgh a few years back when Andrew McCutcheon was uh, – he's always been a three-hole guy, three guy forever, and then all of a sudden he starts hitting in the two-hole, and everyone was kind of questioning it, but did have some success, and no, then he went sure. – you know, he got traded. But it yeah. was a good spot, yeah. No doubt. Um, next question is being, uh, Ryan and I are brothers and yourself and your brother both played professional baseball and kind of want to touch on that. How, how having an older brother, what was that like having the chance to play against him, play with them? And he was already kind of in the professional system at the time you're getting drafted. How did that help you as a player from college transitioning into pro ball? Well, I, I think you hit on it. And what I want to start it out with is it kind of made it realistic to me, yeah. you know, yeah. having someone make it, having someone play division one baseball, then end up making, getting drafted, then end up having success in the majors after he makes it, it kind of let me, it kind of let the situation be relatable. Like, Oh, and you, you know, of course, brotherly competition. Hey, right. if he can do it, I can kind of do it type thing. Yeah. Um, Cause I think sometimes we think, not that these guys aren't the greatest in, in the world that are playing, but I think sometimes we think, you know, oh, he, he does this, this, and this. Yes, they are the best in the world, but also they're still throwing the same as some guys that you're facing in college or in high school. Yeah. You know, yes, they're very more refined and they do a lot of other great things, but a 90 mile an hour, a 95 mile an hour fastball is a 95 mile an hour fastball. Right. Yeah. For sure. Kind of said it better. Is um, what was it? You were you both were in Oakland the year he won the MVP, correct? Yes. Was uh, do you ever joke with him saying like you brought the better side out of him? You two had to get on the same <laughs> team and uh, push him a little bit more. <laughs> well, if you do look at his numbers, the two uh, two years we were together, he was MVP, and then the second year he was second. <laughs> no, hey, no, that's, that's, no, that's a big you right there <laughs> no just no disrespect to uh ichiro who did win it that year but <laughs> that's right jason had two monster years and i think it comes back to you know when you have someone who knows each other so well and talking hitting talking at bats i remember multiple times on the bench i remember locker room talks he was right next to me mm-hmm. you yeah. know talking about games and pitchers and what we wanted to do. And, you know, sometimes when you have that sounding board, you know, it just kind of gives you that, you know, little more confidence to go up there and, and stick with that approach and, and know what you want to do. Absolutely. Right. Cause you, you have that trust with them. You can kind of, you, you know, you've known him your whole life. It's like, if he tells me something, I, I'm probably going to listen to it rather than, you know, the new guy who just came through the system that year. I, completely agree I, I can attest like Mick and I if we played on the same team together we would always push each other back to back and end mm-hmm. up having better years I think it was a, a good motivator and we would build off each other just like you said yeah that's exactly sure. right absolutely next, next question I had for you was going to be about uh technology in the game today D- different guys have different opinions as we've talked and asked asked with and you know we're we're kind of not buying into, but we haven't yet, but we're probably going to about either getting like a rap soda or a, or a hit tracks or some sort of technology machine to do lessons with group lessons with. And, and how does that basically resonate in your head or, or big leaguers heads today versus it when it would have, if you were there um, back when you played? Well, I, I think, you know, obviously it's where the game has got to, right? I mean, right. It's made the game exciting, I think, for the fans, um, home run wise, exit velo, launch angle. They talk about all these things, but it's also a great tool. Um, and I'm kind of going backwards, so I'll kind of hit on this first. So it's also a great tool for scouting and and comparing yourself 
you know, with a number that, you know, against other guys. And I think, you know, say we've got 12 year olds, say we got 14 year olds, say we got high school guys. If you're an 85 guy and this guy's an 85 guy, you know, you're comparable, right? I mean, yeah. so I think it gives us um, that kind of ability to look at a true number. Now, hitting back on that, like you guys said, buying into it or not buying into it. And we were growing up, we were never huge into it, you know, right. but obviously I think we've got to at some point look at it and say, it is part of the game now. Yeah. How do we do it using what we know and our knowledge to our benefit? You know, right. a lot of things I do with Rap Soto is uh, I'm a guy who's not really worried about a max exit velo. I'm more worried about say, uh, we take 50 swings. How many did you hit hard and averages and some of the other yeah. things? Because I feel like that is is just as important or more important than oh he hit 100 he hit one 400 feet. No, I want I want to see consistency because yeah. I think consistency in our game is how you become successful. Yeah, everything right. in our game, whether it's taking good at bats, the more good at bats you take, you know, the more times you put yourself in the right situation hopefully you'll be more successful. Yeah. Right, man. Consistency is key in baseball, and it's, it's – once you find it, it's, it's there, and that's what's going to help you succeed. Yeah. No, I completely agree with that. I think that's the best way to kind of look at it because I even recall my last year in minor league ball, and one of the most important stats they were looking at was – exit velo off the bat your average your average exit velo off the bat because they wanted to see someone who's putting the ball in play hard because that's going to give them a better chance that the ball is going to find a hole so I think the way that you're using the technology today I think that that's awesome thank you yeah spot on yeah uh last question close it up here something fun just want to ask you your favorite baseball memory been through a lot of the major leagues minor or minors majors winning a collegiate national championship what's your favorite well um, obviously probably playing with my brother. Mm -hmm. I, awesome. I think you guys can relate to that. Um, like you said, would have loved having him there. Um, you know, I got the opportunity to do that. Um, you know, it was just exciting to see him at the ballpark, you know, have the opportunity playing against other teams, doing some, some great things in the game, brothers records, you know, home runs, yeah. five, you know, a lot of different things. And um, as fun as it was to play in the Boston, New York series against each yeah. other. I, Just going to ask you about that. Yeah. I have to, I have to stay, say playing in Oakland, great teams, playoffs, you know, just experiencing that with, you know, probably my best friend too. That's awesome. That's an awesome yeah. answer, man. It's you know it right on the head. Yeah, when when you're four or five years old, that's something you're when you're with your brother. It's you're you're visualizing Game Seven, World Series, playing wiffle ball, and and you guys got the experience of 162 games together, and that 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 is awesome. Yep, yep. And and Jeremy, while you were in the league, just one random question that just came to me: What was who do you think the hardest or like most trouble pitcher you've ever had to hit off of was? I'm just curious. You know, for me, probably the one I faced the most that was probably the most difficult yeah. was Pedro Martinez. And right. the reason why – I mean, obviously I faced Randy Johnson in spring training, right. but I really didn't have at-bats against him. So, for me, it was Pedro when he was, like, in Boston, I think, uh, in his heyday. I mean, we're talking this guy, and to this day, I don't know if he did it on purpose, but he would – go to O just to mess with you a little bit and then come back and throw strikes. He, he claims he did it, but you know, hitting on that, he could hit, throw any pitch, hit any corner. And you know, so you thought you had him at two O you're going to get a heater. He'd go back door slider, not slider <laughs> over the middle. Then he'd go change up outside corner. You're like, okay, now what's coming? Cause you just have no clue. I mean, right. he did it to a T had four, just above average or, you know, whatever you want to call him. I mean, and could, could throw him anytime he wanted. No, that's he it. was one of my childhood icons, man. I was a huge Pedro <laughs> fan. Yeah, <laughs> uh, no doubt about it. <laughs> well, Jeremy, we appreciate you hopping on, man. Viewers, remember, give him a follow. His, uh, his website, you have a website, correct? 
Yeah, so a couple things, uh, jeremygiambi.com and also social media, it's at Jeremy Giambi. So awesome. hit me up. Um, I try to post some things. I'm getting better at it. I know some guys are professionals at it. <laughs> you know, this technology thing, we got to buy <laughs> into it, right? It's how the world's moving. You got to. <laughs> Well, hey, we appreciate you. Yeah, viewers, give yeah, him a follow. So watch him, follow him. It's not every day you get to uh, hear and learn from someone that experienced it firsthand. So thanks again, Jeremy. We appreciate it. Hey, thank you guys, and keep doing what you're doing. And uh, like I said, uh, let's do it again sometime and, and have a little fun. Absolutely. Absolutely, no man. We appreciate it. it. Thank you.